Welcome back and to everyone who has participated in the group picture to support abortion rights in Poland. Thank you. It's very much appreciated. And now we have come to the last session on this very busy and intense uh, European Greens Council. Uh, it's about the topic challenges and pathways in Europe's rule of law crisis. So what are the backsliding tendencies in the EU rule of law and what consequences do they have for the citizens living in countries um, where the rule of law is being violated, and but also the consequences for the EU institutions. Evelyn Huytenbroek will moderate this uh, debate and will introduce her panel members participating in this uh, debate. Evelyn is co-chair for the European Greens since last year. Uh, for 10 years, she was a regional minister of environment, energy, social affairs and youth here in Belgium. So it makes it a bit easier for her to be here present in this studio uh, in Brussels. So a very welcome and good luck, Evelyn. Thank you, and thank you to you, Francesca, to be with us today. And thank you to all of you to be with us for this second very important plenary on the question, very actual question, of rule of law. So for months, we have seen restrictive governments uh, action around Europe related or not to the COVID-19 crisis. And in the same time, we see unprecedented wave of citizen protest against authoritarian government. And at the same time also, and this week especially, there are important discussions and deliberations going on, the EU's next seven-year budget and on the coronavirus recovery fund. Some countries like Poland and Hungary blackmail this budget and refuse to respect the rule of law on different topics. And yet, the rule of law is one of the fundamental values of the Union, because the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights. So, I know that it's impossible in one hour 30 to tackle the whole question extensively. So we will try with our speakers to have some views from different angles and from different European contexts on this issue. And first, some practical and technical instructions. So we will have first some speakers by video some also with me in the studio, and others on the Zoom. So it's real, a real hybrid plenary. But we will try to have 20 minutes for a Q&A session. Questions to our live panelists will only be taken in written form, so please send them in through the question button on Spot Me and throughout the whole session, but they will be only addressed when we get to the Q&A. Be careful, we know we are very short on time, so not all questions will be read, only selected ones, but we know that we have to come back on this debate later also with you. And now let's begin with our first green speaker. Remember January 2020? the Austrian Greens entered the federal governments of Austria. The Greens have five, four ministers, and among them, there is a strategic portfolio. The Minister of Justice for Alma Zadic. She is expert on anti-corruption and transparency and passionate about human rights. We received from Alma a video message with very recent news about the outcome of the Council of the EU meeting between Ministers of Justice of the 2nd of December on the rule of law mechanism, but also reflections on the Commission's annual report on the rule of law and on discrepancies and the Austrian government's position. So, Alma, the video is for now. Dear colleagues and friends, 
It's a great honor and pleasure for me to address the discussion on challenges and pathways in Europe's rule of law crisis. Thank you for this great invitation and I'm happy um, to deliver my video message. Respect for the rule of law is a common value of democratic societies around the world. However, as we all know, recent developments, even in some European countries, have shown how fragile this fundamental commitment to the achievement of the rule of law can be. Legislative and uh, executive authorities have to generally abstain from any influence on the judiciary, for example. By European understanding, the independence of the judiciary is a central achievement and an indispensable element of the rule of law. The independence of the judiciary must therefore be vigorously defended. Attacks on the judiciary, on the independent judges, are also attacks on our basic common value, on the rule of law. And they can endanger the trust of our citizens, endanger the trust in the judiciary, endanger the trust in our democracy. The rule of law is only as strong as the trust of its citizens in it. Therefore, strengthening the rule of law and the trust of the citizens is something that has to be done on a constant basis. This makes it to our obligation to continue the fight to protect and strengthen the rule of law and also emphasize the independence of the judiciary as an indispensable part of it. And if we think of the COVID-19 crisis, under no circumstances should we allow that the COVID crisis be used as an excuse for shortcomings in the judicial system or as an excuse for lowering our standards or violating our basic legal guarantees. And I also want to talk about uh, a very important topic the European Commission recently presented its rule of law report. And I think this is a great new mechanism in order to review the rule of law on the basis of an annual rule of law report. Because it is central and important to underline the basic, this, this basic value within the European Union. And under the German presidency, a general debate on the rule of law report was held at the October Foreign Affairs Council and the debate on some individual member states um, took place in November. It is essential, therefore, to in initiate a constructive dialogue on the rule of law issues and at the same time also review our own deficiencies. Therefore, I think it's of utmost importance that the European Commission is issuing the report. The rule of law cycle aims to provide member states with insights on how to address specifically identified challenges and learn from each other's experiences. The, this exchange is more or less a homework on how the rule of law can be further strengthened while fully respecting national constitutional systems and traditions. It is our European tradition to uphold the rule of law and strengthen the rule of law. Therefore, it's important to understand that every single system has as a whole to be looked at. We cannot compare one isolated measure to another isolated measure as these measures are embedded in an integral system of checks and balances. Some small changes that might work in one member state might not have the same impact on the rule of law in a different member state. However, the report shows that while many member states already meet very high standards in the field of rule of law, there are still major challenges in the European Union. The report sets out both positive, 
but are also negative developments across the European Union and it's important to take these seriously. And as visible in the report, this is particularly true since January 2019. During the last Council meeting this week, on the 2nd of December, it was agreed that there, are regular, that there will be regular exchanges on this important subject in the Justice and Home Affairs Council. As it is as its intention, the European Commission's rule of law cycle was praised as a good basis for strengthening the rule of law. And a lot of member states agreed that this is a good way to strengthen and develop further our rule of law system. Many ministers stressed the importance of the judiciary and the importance of its independence, but also the efficiency, because efficient judiciary is of utmost importance if we want to sustain the trust into, into the judiciary, but also develop and strengthen rule of law. Also, many ministers were open to the idea that of a practitioners forum, where judges can exchange views explicitly together on topics relating the rule of law, relating um, the integrity and independence of the judiciary. However, not all member states were of this opinion. As you can imagine, two member states were not happy with the rule of law cycle. They argued that they were not involved in the preparation of the cycle and thus they rejected the report as being one-sided. One member state even saw a risk that judges coming together to participate in this uh, um, cross-country forum could violate the pro prohibition of non-political action of judges. But let me emphasize, for me as a Minister of Justice in Austria, the preservation of this core European value is central. And the rule of law is a central pillar of our democracy and one of our core values. And I'm therefore convinced that the rule of law conditionality to protect the European budget is essential. Above all, Austria welcomes the fact that measures are to be taken as soon as there is a threat of misuse of EU funds due to breaches of the rule of law. And furthermore, we also welcome the fact that there are examples, for example, for rule of law breaches, such as threats to the independence of the judiciary or restrictions on the availability and effectiveness of legal remedies and that the procedure for adopting measures is being accelerated. I'm convinced that the current discussion will lead to an increased recognition of the achievements of the constitutional state. But in any case, I will continue to fight, to fight tirelessly to improve our rule of law system and defend the independency of the judiciary as its basic pillar in Austria and at the European level. I wish you all fruitful discussion, in particular on this very important is issue on, on rule of law, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Alma Zadic, for, uh, for this, uh, this speech. And now we have the second speaker, who is our expert. It's uh, Laurent Pech, also with a, a video. Laurent Pech is French, but uh, he is professor of European law and head of the law and politics department at Middlesex University of London. And he is also a member of the editorial board of the Hague Journal on the Rule of Law. His video message concerns the concept of rule of law and rule of law backsliding, but also he will give the examples of Poland and Hungary, and we thank him to send us this video. 
Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants to the conference organized by the European Greens, um, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Laurent Pesch. I'm a professor of uh, European Law at Middlesex University, London. In this uh, short video, I'm going to explain the nature of the rule of law crisis uh, now uh, uh, being faced by the EU and uh, why, in my view, it amounts to an existential threat to the functioning of the EU legal order. Uh, to begin with, let me uh, try to make sense of the rule of law crisis and its nature. I have used the concept of uh, rule of law backsliding in my writings. And uh, what do I mean by rule of law backsliding? Essentially, uh, first of all, uh, this, uh, this is a process. Uh, this is essentially a process of dismantlement of all checks and balances by elected authority. Arguably, this process began uh, first in 2010 in Hungary. Um, but what do I mean by process and what is so important about this uh, process? It is arguably that this is a deliberate process. So we have here elected public authorities essentially deliberately trying to undermine uh, democracy and the rule of law in their own member state. Now, why would they want uh, to do that, uh, one may ask? Essentially, I would argue that the long-term plan is, first of all, the dismantlement of the democratic liberal state in order to entrench uh, then in the second, uh, to entrench the long-term uh, rule of the ruling party. Um, exhibit A uh, is arguably Hungary, indeed, uh, according to a network of democracy experts uh, in a report published last year. According to this network of democracy experts, Hungary became the EU's first authoritarian regime uh, in the EU. Uh, authoritarian regime or electoral autocracy is another concept being used in this uh, uh, regard. What do we mean here? Essentially, uh, we have in Hungary uh, Potemkin-like institutions giving the illusion that Hungary is a democracy, but in fact, in practice, uh, minimum standards uh, regarding democracy and the rule of law are systematically uh, undermined. So to the extent that, yes, you have uh, uh, regular elections, but these elections are structurally unfair to the advantage, of course, of the ruling party. Um, exhibit B is arguably uh, Poland. Uh, you could argue, in fact, uh, I would uh, submit that uh, in a year or two, uh, Poland under the current uh, uh, regime uh, should also uh, most likely uh, become the EU's second uh, authoritarian uh, regime, or second authoritarian country in the EU. In more practical terms, uh, rule of law backsliding has resulted in, for instance, uh, with that being exhaustive, in uh, uh, the capture of uh, national courts, uh, including the appointment of uh, fake judges, uh, fake courts. Um, in addition to this, we can also mention uh, the capture of the public broadcasting uh, uh, sector. Uh, why would you uh, capture the public broadcaster uh, to shape the narrative uh, while you are systematically undermining uh, checks and balances and also you can use then uh, the public media to distract uh, citizens uh, from the ongoing destruction of uh, checks and balances. While this is ongoing, um, also uh, what we have seen is uh, wide-scale corruption, industrial-scale misuse of EU funds to enrich uh, the local supreme leader and uh, his uh, network of uh, friends uh, and uh, protégés. Uh, also, uh, uh, and a, a concrete uh, aspect uh, which is worth mentioning is that uh, usually autocrats and would-be autocrats uh, tend to um, undertake uh, uh, state-sponsored uh, hate campaigns. So what they would do is they're going to target civil society groups uh, minorities uh, think about uh, the situation now regarding LGBT people and who are the subject of state-sponsored aid campaigns in Hungary and Poland. So this is, uh, these are just, uh, this is a non-exhaustive list uh, of uh, the concrete aspects of rule of law backsliding what, while it is unfolding. Uh, but as I said before, remember that the long-term plan here is simply the entrenchment of the ruling party. Now, why is this a threat to the functioning of the EU legal order? Uh, first of all, it's important to uh, re uh, remind everyone that uh, according to the EU treaties, uh, the EU is supposed to be based on a number of foundational values, including, of course, democracy and respect for the rule of law. Uh, according to the Court of Justice, the EU legal order is actually uh, uh, based on a key premise. According to the Court of Justice, this premise is that each member state shares with all the other member states 
the same set of uh, values, uh, including uh, respect for the rule of law, respect for minimum democratic standards. This is why, uh, based on this premise, that we have set up in the EU an area of justice uh, which is uh, essentially uh, concretely uh, implementing the principles of mutual trust and mutual recognition of judgments. So if, he, if it's not for this premise, then we cannot have uh, mutual trust, we cannot have mutual recognition of uh, judgments. Uh, sadly, we have now reached a stage where this premise is uh, violated uh, openly on a day-to-day -day basis. If you just look at the recent news uh, uh, coming from, again, uh, Poland and Hungary, who are the, currently the two uh, EU member states subject to the so-called Article 7 procedure. So what we're seeing, essentially, in my view, is an existential threat to, to the functioning of the EU legal order. This is why rule of law backsliding uh, should be tackled heads on and uh, to do so, I mean, we have seen some legal actions undertaken by the EU Commission, but I would say uh, most of the time it has been too little, too late. Uh, what we need now is no more dialogue, uh, no more uh, reports. What we need is uh, legal action, uh, prompt legal action, and I would argue also financial sanctions, unless, of course, uh, one doesn't mind seeing the EU evolving from a community of values uh, to a community where democratic regimes uh, coexist uh, with authoritarian regimes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laurent Pech. And now we, we arrive to our second part uh, of this plenary. Uh, with our four panelists. One will be with me in the studio and three by, uh, by Zoom. So the first one, we begin with Sylvia Sporek. She is from Poland. She is the first Polish MEP to join the Green Group quite recently. And she is also vice chair of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. She is also a lawyer, a legislator, and certainly a feminist activist working on women's rights as human rights. And she was former deputy commissioner for human rights in Poland. Sylvia, I shall give you five, six minutes, and I have two main questions for you. There have been worrying news coming from Poland in recent months. Laurent Pesch was telling that. The Constitutional Tribunal has made one of the most restrictive legal regimes in Europe towards terminations of pregnancy. We have seen that citizens answered with the biggest mobilization in Poland since the fall of communism. We also heard about the efforts from the government to delay appointing a new ombudsman as much as possible. What do these steps mean for fundamental human rights and in particular for women's rights in Poland? And what should be done on a European level that would benefit the people of Poland? Good uh, to everybody. And as Professor Pesch uh, said, uh, the current situation in Poland and in Hungary is really worrying. But this situation and uh, the fact that in the 21st century, in the European Union, human rights are still violated is the result, are the result of the fact that for years we have not conducted a debate on our values. I have the impression that the constant race for European funds launching new EU programs, the constant development of European bureaucracy made us forget what the EU values are and why the European Union exists. I come from a country where principle of equality, the right to dignity, the right to independent life are still our dreams. And this is not just the result of five years of the law and the justice ruling. This has been the, the reality of women, people with disabilities, the elderly, LGBTI people, Roma people, migrant women for many years. And as a human rights defender, I think Poland is a leader of negligence of implementation of women's rights throughout the European Union. 
Polish women have not had the right to abortion, mother contraception, have not been protected from domestic violence and sexual violence, have not had access to modern methods of infertility treatment. The child alimony system has not been working. They have no had guarantees of anesthesia during childbirth for 30 years. And these are only examples of unsolved issues for Polish women. Over the years, women's rights have not been a priority for governments in Poland. Left-wing, right-wing, centrist governments have done anything or just too little. Can we say that the constitution was respected in Poland that time? Can we say that women in Poland lived in a country of democracy and rule of law that time? No, and this is very worrying for me because we started talking about the violation of the constitution in Poland only when PIS began to destroy the judiciary and the European Union did not raise the issue of the violation of the rule of law when the rights of women in Poland were violated, but only when PIS violated independence of the Constitutional Tribunal, the Supreme Court, the judiciary, the prosecutors, and the freedom of media. Before that, and this is very sad for me, no one noticed that in the center of Europe, in a member state of the European Union, women and many other groups did not have fundamental rights. And I'm saying this because it's high time for broader understanding of rule of law in the European Union. The rule of law should mean the respect of human rights. Is it possible that the European Union exists without human rights? We can have the best climate policy, proper common agricultural policy, great highways. But can all this replace a fundamental human rights? Can we talk about the cohesion policy in a situation where millions of women in Poland do not have access to a gynecologist? Can we talk about cohesion policy without a uniform European standards of protection of women from domestic violence? Can we talk about a cohesion policy without uniform standards and equal access of all European women to safe and legal abortion? I can imagine that there can be a European Union without a good common agricultural policy, but it cannot exist with, without equality, dignity and solidarity. What I'm talking about may sound like a dream for many of you but it's about time we started talking about it. As a lawyer, I know that a lot depends on the change of the treaties, but if human rights in the European Union are to depend on the change of the EU treaties, let's start debating it, start lobbying it, and start creating alliances. December the 3rd, we celebrated the International Day of People with Disabilities. More than a thousand days ago, a group of people, maybe some of you remember this, a people with disabilities and their caregivers had a protest in the Polish parliament. They were there for 40 days. It was in 2018, Poland was in the European Union for years, and they had to demand their fundamental human rights. They just wanted to have the right to an independent life uh, to be respected. They wanted decent benefits, personal assistance, and assisted housing system. How many European funds are, loc are allocated to the implementation of these rights? More than a month uh, ago in Poland, women and their ally allies started to protest because once again, politicians decided to take away women's rights. Yes, I'm talking once again, because the Constitutional Tribunal in Poland already did it twice. The tribunal did it when Poland was ruled by the left-wing party, and it did it when Poland was ruled by the civic platform. And it did it now, when PIS rules Poland. For me, it's very obvious that the only guarantee of the protection of human rights in the European Union is the European Union itself. 
because they may, may be more Kaczynskis and more Orbans in the future. They could try to take more rights from us, but they could not do it if the fundamental rights are guarded by the European Union. And I think, to conclude, this is political opportunity for the Greens. Perhaps we should become the leaders of the debate on this matter. I would like the European Greens to become a symbol of progressive thinking, a symbol of thinking about a unified, a real unified European Union and the symbol of the European Union of human rights. And we have a huge responsibility as the Greens. We have the courage and we have the independence to start, to start a large European debate about the greatest challenges that lie ahead. It's high time we started reading the EU treaties from the first page to the last one. And if the treaty says equality between women and men and protection against discrimination are the values of the EU, let's finally start implementing these values. And last point, once we had a prime minister in Poland who announced that Poland was a green island, who preferred to build stadiums and football fields instead of investing in healthcare and education, he called violations of human rights a compromise. I want us to stay away from such politicians. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much, uh, Sylvia. And be sure, in the name of the European Greens, I can say that we will be, we, we are with you on all this uh, fight. And I take the opportunity also to say hello to all the Greens, Polish, the, all the Polish Greens who are with us this, uh, this evening. And now we have the second speaker for this uh, plenary, coming from Hungary. Coming, he is from Hungarian, but he is here in Brussels with me in the studio. Benedek Javor. Benedek, you are a former Green MEP from Hungary, and now you are head of the representation of Budapest to the EU in Brussels. You are a biologist and politician, former leading M member of LMP and currently leading member of the Dialogue for Hungary Party. I also have two questions for you. We could hear a lot in international media about measures implemented by the Hungarian government under the guise of the COVID-19 emergency in recent months. What were and are the effects of these measures on Budapest and local governments in Hungary? And the Polish and Hungarian governments have blocked the acceptance of the EU's next seven-year budget and its <coughs> COVID-19 recovery fund. What are the implications of this blockage for Hungary? And what can be done on a European level to ensure that those that need these funds the most still receive them. Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to this um, uh, plenary session to discuss this very important issue of, of rule of law. And unfortunately, yes, we in Hungary, we are experts of uh, uh, the topic as uh, we are experiencing the dismantling of, of democracy and the rule of law in Hungary for uh, 10 years now. Um, and um, as Laurent Pesch already uh, pointed out in uh, his speech, uh, this didn't start with the COVID crisis. So what is going on in Hungary and what we experience in Hungary has a long history. But of course, during the COVID crisis, many uh, procedures or tendencies were uh, speeded up uh, by the government uh, because they used the COVID crisis as a perfect smoke screen or, or a cover story, be, and behind it, uh, they could um, speed up and intensify uh, the efforts to undermine uh, checks and balances, democratic institutions, and in, in general, uh, rule of law and, and democracy in, in, in Hungary. Uh, this goes to different directions, and um, already it was mentioned uh, the, the role of and the importance of, of the uh, 
media freedom and how uh, media freedom and, and independent media is under attack in Hungary, what is the role of the, the public service media, the public broadcaster, and so on and so forth. But in Hungary there is a, a, a special area uh, where the government started to, uh, to step up quite intensively against uh, in Hungary because last year, last October, we had local elections in Hungary and after nine years of, of uh, continuous defeats uh, by the government, the opposition parties, the democratic opposition, got uh, some quite strong positions uh, at uh, those elections, uh, including uh, the capital city of Budapest. Uh, so the mayor of Budapest is from uh, Dialogue, a Green Party, uh, backing by a coalition or backed by a coalition of, of liberal and, and uh, leftist and green parties. Um, but uh, beyond Budapest, there are many other cities in the countryside also led by coalitions of, uh, of uh, the democratic uh, opposition. And uh, the government, that was the first time that the Hungarian government had to, to face with uh, major defeats um, and uh, the reaction, of course, as you can expect from an authoritarian uh, government, was uh, to undermine uh, the, the independence and uh, the competencies of uh, uh, the local governments, the municipalities. This started with um, a major, and the COVID crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, was, uh, was the perfect uh, uh, cover story for that. Uh, so, for example, they started to cut the funding of the municipalities. Of course, the municipalities, local governments, had many uh, additional um, things to do during the COVID crisis. Mainly, the cities were in the, the front line of the fight against the uh, uh, COVID crisis. This also needed additional sources and um, additional financial contribution to, uh, to this fight. And the government realized that with, with cutting uh, the incomes uh, of the, the municipalities, uh, they can create an extremely difficult situation for uh, the, the opposition-led municipalities, and they can, of course, help those municipalities which are still in the hands of the, uh, the government. But it's not only about money. They also started to, uh, to limit uh, the competences and the rights uh, of, uh, of the local government. Uh, and uh, besides of uh, uh, the state budget sources, also they made attempts uh, to limit the own incomes, the own resources of, uh, of the municipalities with, um, for example, uh, uh, with um, uh, launching free parking in the cities as parking fees represent a major income for the local governments, or they raised the idea of uh, uh, the abolition of, uh, of uh, different kind of, for example, local business taxes and so on and so forth, which could create a completely intolerable situation for the, uh, for the local governments. So what we see now, it's really an, a very intensive fight uh, between uh, the government and uh, the municipalities. And also this affects, or it has an effect to uh, the EU funding. And that's why, as municipalities, uh, we started a campaign to um, influence the European decision-making and uh, to amend uh, the next MFF regulation and the recovery package, including the recovery and resilience uh, facility, to open up direct funding channels uh, to, to local governments mm -hmm. and to, to municipalities. Because we see that the government uh, has strong attempts to, to derive to, uh, uh, the EU funds from the municipalities, from the opposition-led uh, municipalities. So it's essential uh, to get better access uh, to the EU funds and also to ensure that the, the local governments, local and regional governments, are better involved in the decision-making regarding uh, the, the EU funds. This could be also mm -hmm. a guarantee for a more efficient and less corrupt um, use of EU funds uh, because um, in a direct funding system uh, the Commission has much more opportunities to keep their eyes on 
uh, the money spending uh, the municipalities in the shared management system they give the money and mainly uh, that is the national government which is uh, controlling uh, how the money is spent there are very limited rights for example for the for Olaf the uh, the anti fraud uh, agency of the uh, of the EU uh, or the commission to control uh, those funds but if at least some financing streams are put in a direct management system. This helps the municipalities under very strong political mm -hmm. pressure in Hungary. Also, it contributes to a more effective, um, for example, a more effective fight against climate change in line with uh, the Green Deal and uh, the new climate targets on the Commission. And it makes uh, much more uh, possible to, uh, to closely control uh, the spending of the, uh, the money. And this takes us to the other question, that what going to, what's going to happen with, um, uh, with the rule of law mechanism, uh, which is linked uh, with um, the next uh, MFF and the, the recovery and resilience uh, facility. And we see the veto of Poland and, and, and Hungary. Um, and. Um, it's an um, extremely important uh, conflict, uh, not only because it's all about the next seven years budget of the EU, but I think that this might be a turning point mm -hmm. uh, in the fight between uh, those authoritarian um, regimes uh, in Poland and Hungary and between, uh, or they fight with, uh, with the European Commission. Because um, in the past 10 years, um, Orban was very much used to uh, uh, a situation where uh, if he was aggressive enough, then he could get anything. And the EU was not able to resist, partly because of structural reasons, partly due to, to political considerations. Mm -hmm. European People's Party was always trying to protect um, its member party, Fidesz, and, and the Hungarian uh, government. But now, what I see that there is a major shift uh, in the approach of the EU. And the EU started to, to resist uh, to the claims and uh, this aggressive, aggressive attitude uh, of the Hungarian uh, government. They prepared the EU, for example, with plan Bs, how to mm -hmm. launch the, the recovery package uh, with leaving out uh, Poland and Hungary with a, an enhanced cooperation of the 25 uh, member states. And that surprised very much the Hungarian prime minister. And I think that this conflict could be really a turning point where uh, the EU, I believe, has quite strong um, cards mm -hmm. in its hands. Um, and um, perhaps Hungary and Poland went too far with too low mm -hmm. uh, cards. And now it's time to stop them. Uh, there is all the opportunities for the EU uh, to do so. And uh, uh, this could change the whole discussion on uh, the democratic backsliding uh, in those countries and in general, the democratic backsliding in the EU. For that, uh, we need that the EU stands firmly behind the rule of law uh, mechanism mm -hmm. proposal and not to give in uh, to this blackmailing of the two, uh, two member state uh, governments. Um, and um, uh, also, not only to, uh, to stand firmly against those governments, but to find uh, the proper allies in those countries. In Poland, in Hungary, big cities are much more progressive, much more mm -hmm. pro-European. Uh, the local governments uh, could be important allies for the EU in this conflict with the national uh, government. And I think that here the EU should uh, start a strategic alliance uh, with the local level, mm -hmm. partly because of the, 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 the political reasons, but partly because those cities are really sharing uh, the, the principles, the priorities, the values and the goals of the EU. Thank you very much, Benedict, because it's very important to say that when we say Hungary, it's not, it's a Hungarian government, national government, it's not all the population. And we know, of course, the campaign of the municipality and uh, also Mr. Karakshani, mm -hmm. we have a dia dialogue with him, but also the four, the four mayors of this group of uh, Viserat, uh, of course. Uh, 
uh, and so also the, the the fight to have the European funds immediately to the to the to the city. So we have to continue, of course, to keep this dialogue. We are not only with Budapest, but also with other cities, because there there are some progressist people, and we have to continue the dialogue and to follow in the next week, of course, uh, the the situation. Thank you very much to be with us and stay with us, because there will be the Q and A after that. But now we are going to the south. Uh, and uh, we go to Malta, to Malta with Mathieu Caruana Galizia. Uh, Mathieu, and we come back to a, to a Zoom. Uh, you are a journalist from Malta. You are the son of uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was assassinated in 2017 for her investigations into the corruption in Malta. You are also the director of the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation and also ex-member of the International Consortium of Investigate Journalists, where you develop the technology that enabled major investigations such as Panama Papers and Paradise Papers. <clears throat> I have also two questions to you, Mathieu. First, tell us what is the importance of the free press, transparency and no victimless crimes. Malta has also had its fair share of problems with regards to political corruption and lack of transparency. Could you share your reflections with us through your personal experiences why the protection of journalists and the freedom of press is vital for functioning democracy, and also what would be the response from the EU? Mathieu? So I, I do believe that freedom of expression is the most fundamental human right. And when we speak of European values, it's 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 one of the most fundamental European values on which everything else is built. If you don't have the freedom to express yourself freely, then all other, all other rights are, are simply useless. And growing up, with, growing up with my mother as a journalist in, in Malta, she was a journalist for 30 years, um, this is something that I really came to appreciate because I could see firsthand the threats that she was receiving and what a struggle it was for her to do her work, especially in the last few years of her life um, when people in government in Malta who are extremely corrupt began to fight against the people who are working to expose that corruption, including my mother. Now, this is, is where it intersects with, with rule of law issues, because the, I guess the, the ambition of people who are corrupt or people who want to, want to achieve complete immunity, impunity for themselves is to stop others from exposing their crimes or stop others from, from even talking about their crimes. And this is effectively what politicians in Malta um, try to do to my mother. And in the end, I guess they succeeded, or politicians working with, with corrupt business people too. Um, now, we're working really hard to change things here in Malta. We've advocated very hard for the start of a public inquiry, and that's progressing. It's, in fact, so effective that the government wants to shut it down. But I do, I do believe that... I mean, it's, it's my mother, so it's very hard for me to say this, that we're, we're using the case to change things in Europe as well. And I think that that's, that's really important. We have to figure out where the failings were at, at a European level too. 
how can European institutions be made more resilient so they can cope better with member states like Malta, Hungary, Poland, and so on, or anywhere, any other member state where in the future there, there could be high-level corruption. And I, I think we're coming closer and closer to this. So um, the European Public Prosecutor's Office, for example, will start functioning at the beginning of the next year. And that's, that's a really radical change for Europe. Um, the crisis in, in the rule of law crisis in Malta forced the government to, to join the EPPO. And I think we're, we're really managing to strengthen these institutions. Like we're, we're getting there. There's, there's certainly a lot more to be done. Um, but I think we will reach a point where it, it will hopefully become more difficult, if not impossible, um, to have murders like, like that of my mother in the future in Europe, simply because um, journalists won't be the ones who, um, who are exclusively responsible um, for fighting corruption, there will be other other institutions in in extreme cases like Malta who can step in and provide a provide a fallback. Um, starting with the EPPO, for example, um, there's also some movement to strengthen the oversight that the European Banking Authority has over money laundering. I hope that these things go through. Because we we really need these um, we really need these authorities or these institutions with with real teeth um, that can actually clamp down, and we we currently don't have enough of those. I think at the European level, everything is is too political. Um, the decisions, too many decisions, ultimately fall down to negotiations. Um, in the European Council or political decisions taken by commissioners. Um, there, are, there are certain things like money laundering and corruption that everyone should be able to agree um, that, they're, that they're fundamentally bad and whether or not to do something about them or to fight them. Um, is not a decision that uh, should, left, should be left up to negotiations between member states or negotiations between political parties, for that matter. But this is the long-term work of the foundation that we've set up in, in my mother's name um, to really strengthen institutions and improve mechanisms for um, making the rule of law more resilient across Europe. Thank you, thank you very much, Mathieu. And uh, I can say that you have all the support of the European Greens uh, on this fight against uh, corruption. Be sure that it's one of our priority. And also, we know that journalists, and you know before being a politician, I was also a journalist, and we know that uh, journalists are also between the first victims of this corruption. Thank you, thank you very much, and stay with us. They stay with us till the, till the end, like Sylvia, uh, because there is a moment of Q&A also after <coughs> uh, uh, the, spe the speakers. And now we have the, the last panelist, um, Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn Del Boss. I don't think I have to present Gwendolyn, but now she is... Uh, MEP, she was former or colleague in the in the in the committee. She is from uh, Europe Ecologie Les Verts, <coughs> and she is vice president of the Green Group. And uh, we invite her because she is also the rapporteur of the file <coughs> on Hungary at the European Parliament. 
So, uh, Gwendolyn, do you believe that the new rule of law mechanism, if adopted, will be an effective tool to protect people's fundamental rights in the EU and the financial interest of the EU from corruption? And if not, what else do we as Greens need to and can achieve? And what are also the Greens pushing for in European institutions in this debate? Gwendolyn, it is your turn. Hello to everyone, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, I am uh, since the beginning of this new term uh, the um, reporter on the Hungarian situation. I am taking from the heritage <clears throat> of my colleague from Netherlands, Judith Sargentini, a Green, but also from a lot of work done by Benedek Javor that uh, we just heard, and, and since years uh, by others. Um, the deterioration of the Hungarian situation is not new. It's a 10-year cycle at least, very strong uh, one, uh, speeding up every year. And it was denounced clearly by uh, civil society in Hungary, but also at the level of the um, Hungarian Parliament, uh, of the European sorry, Parliament, and also in Hungarian Parliament from some opposition. Um, and uh, to answer your question, is this tool uh, the, the right one? Uh, and to answer the most more global question of the plenary, uh, uh, how to, what are the tools to 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 fight and and these challenges? Well, I would say that um, courage and political will is the most efficient of our um, uh, of any tools. I mean, in fact, there are numerous tools we can use. Uh, the Article Seven procedure that was launched against the Hungarian government uh, by the European Parliament and was launched against Poland by the Commission could be a very powerful tool. Um, it's only deficient because, um, as it's just been said by Matthew, in Council, negotiations have, um, in fact, for years prevented this tool to be really used. The report from the Commission, um, uh, our first uh, speaker talked about the, 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 the Australian mis minister, um, is, could be a very powerful tool because it's a state of play of the rule of law in every member state and it is getting awareness of everyone of where we, we are in every member state on rule of law. But if this report stays in a, a desk, nicely put, it will have no efficiency. There are infringement procedures that the Commission can launch. They are not launched for years in Hungarian situation, a bit more in the Polish situation because the lack of independence of the justice is so blatant that they had to. But when they can in Commission, they also ignore the problem because they don't dare, so they don't do, they don't launch procedures. They are the, the next, um, you, uh, Matthew talked about it, there's of course the pro, uh, European prosecutor that could be a very useful tool and there we hope that we chose a person which will have this courage, but if it was a weak person, nothing could happen. Um, there are all sorts of money laundering um, actions that can be done and then there's this rule of law conditionality instrument. I mean, this instrument will not be a miracle instrument. This rule of law conditional instrument has to be uh, triggered, triggered by the um, council, uh, council. It has to be dis it has to be done on a proposal of the commission. So the commission has to decide that they're going to do a proposal. Then the council has to decide that they will try doing this. This can be very uh, low and very def and deficient if in all these places, people don't want to do it. And that's what we've been seeing since years. In the European Parliament, most of all, we can say that in all groups, you have people fighting about this, or let's say in all democratic groups, you have people fighting about it. And we have seen big majorities in the European Parliament to defend all of these tools and to ask Commission and Council to use them. But every time we, what we have seen is commissions that have failed, Commission and Council failing using it. One day, we hope this democracy will be mature. It will not be ruled by unanimity. It will not be only about political negotiations. And if you're a government where your party is one of the big, in the big groups, 
you will be you will avoid problems we can hope that one day we are in this mature democracy we are not for the moment so what we need for the moment are people that decide to act on the tools that exist um, once again all of this is linked um, the corruption is a huge problem as matthew said because indeed um the misuse of the European money is probably also what helped people like Orban in Hungary and others to become autocrats and to have money and to become oligarchs and to, for example, buy all the newspapers and there's no more pluralism of media. We also know that this corruption is helping in a number of member states, some gov self governments. It also means that today people can buy European citizenship uh, by schemes that help them in Malta, in Cyprus, Al Jazeera denounced very well all of this system. So it also means that our democracy is in problem in a number of member states, and it's an a overall a fight that we have to, to, to do. The European Greens have always been uh, on the um, front of this fight. Once again, I'm, I'm only coming after others that did the work. Uh, Benedek here, he worked a long time on, on these golden passport work. So, I mean, you have here, Sylvia has been working for a very, very long time too on all of these topics. You have here the four front runners. And now, and I will finish on that, what we need also is awareness. We lack awareness. We lack awareness in governments. We lack awareness in parliaments. We lack awareness in citizens. Uh, in, in society. We need the people to understand what is happening in Hungary, in Poland, this golden passport system in Malta, in Cyprus and elsewhere. We need to people to understand that one, when one rule of law is deteriorating in one place, it's our common future that it's concerned, not only because you've got the risk of dissemination, and of course, then other government can think, oh, Orban is doing this, so I can try too, because it, it seems to work. Not only because, as Laurent Pesch said, mutual trust in justice is something that is uh, uh, at the moment um, making us do a lot of th things. We surrender sometimes people to some of the governments because there's European arrest warrant, or we will have other just uh, judiciary cooperation. So mutual trust means that if these governments don't have independence of justice, we are doing something really, really wrong. And then, of course, the misuse of the money, it's how European money that is used and sometimes misused and put in the pocket of a few persons. So we are all concerned. And if we want tomorrow European Union not to be a place where functionaries and members of parliament, members of commission and council go on working, but it has no signification anymore for anyone, we must put an end to this rule of law deterioration everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gwendolyn. We are very proud of you also and all your work there in the European Parliament. Now we will have two very short reactions, but I have to repeat that there, everywhere in Europe, from the Greens, you can send your questions if you want to our panelists, to our speakers, but only written uh, questions. We will have a short moment, uh, unfortunately too short, for this Q&A after the two reactions that we have now. And the first one is Daniel Freund. He is Green MEP from Germany and is part of the EU Parliament negotiating team on the rule of law mechanism. So, Daniel, are you with us this evening for this short? Okay, hello, Daniel. Yes? Yet, despite this terrible backsliding that has just been described to us, we have seen in the in the last few months a situation where large majority in the parliament, the European Commission, large majority in the council, the German presidency, everyone supports a strong rule of law conditionality, yet Orban has prevailed. I mean, I was in these negotiations and I could see step after step how this instrument was, uh, was weakened and um, we, of course, made this compromise, as, as all the groups in the European Parliament, against this backdrop of millions of Europeans, thousands of businesses needing a lifeline 
from the European Union urgently in this in this deep economic crisis that we're in. So I really have to insist that this appeasement policy that particularly the conservatives have been doing uh, towards Orban over the last 10 years, I, I really hope that the council that we're going into next week, the European uh, summit, puts an end to 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 that and and that we finally draw a red line and say th this is enough now um we're we're being serious about this so i hope that the german presidency brings home this this condi conditionality finally but i think we also have to accept that this conditionality if it comes online on the 1st of january is not the silver bullet that is going to solve everything uh, gwen has spoken that political resolve is is the only thing that helps here. So we Greens need to keep on the fight to push the commission to use the tools that they already have, right? Launch infringements, ask for financial sanctions where the uh, court rulings are not respected or accepted. Uh, stop funding where you can under the common provisions regulation. Put more funding to in, uh, investigative journalists, to NGOs on the ground that are exposing uh, the the violation of fundamental rights and corruption that I think is the fight for us Greens. Thanks. Thank thank you very much thank you very much Daniel for uh, your intervention. Yes, of course, law never save a situation. But as Laurent Pech said, there was there is a time for dialogue, but there is also a time for action, and we are sure that it's now also this time. And now we give also the floor to Sandra Regol, who is the General Secretary of Europe Ecology Les Verts from France, because you heard certainly that this last week there were many protests, many movements in France, in Paris, again, this law on the uh, Macron law on uh, security and uh, and so I give the floor to Sandra hello Sandra bonjour in terms of decline of the rule of law France is not spared more discreet but yet profound these attacks could open up a dangerous case law in the long term contemporary France maybe you know it was built on four great laws the law of 1905, known as the law on secularism, laicité in French, which gives the right to believe or not believe in a religion. The 1901 law on the right of association, the 1881 uh, law on press freedom and the laws of education. These four fundamentals are currently put in danger by French Interior Minister Gérald Darmanin and his new law project. To attack this law is to attack the French rule of law. It is to question our motto inscribed on the frontispiece of town halls, freedom, equality, fraternity. The fight against this, we fight against this drift with NGO and left parties, but these transformations are subtle. And this is Mr. Darmanin's and Mr. Macron's strategy. Micro transformations are more difficult to attack than the withdrawal of our fundamental laws. This helped to accustom the population step by step to a martialization of society. But after the terrorist attacks we suffered, the instrumentalization, the instrumentalization of the fear of Muslims is a real rupture in the society, a rupture on which the right parties flourished from the extreme right to Macron, but also a rupture on which uh, all is possible. So the fight just began and we need all the support of Europe and Green parties in this fight. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. And now uh, the q and A. I I have three questions and I begin with one question from uh, Adrien from uh, the Swiss Greens. Yes, Swiss Greens are with us this evening. And uh, he asks, do the other countries have a possibility to set up a separate mechanism excluding Poland and Hungary from the recovery fund if no other solution is found, which would be obviously preferable, 
And uh, so maybe I can, it's difficult to manage the, <laughs> the Q&A session <laughs> like this, but I try. And so I can ask, maybe I see Gwendolyn. Do you have, do you, can you answer to this question, Gwen? Yes, um, so indeed it is one of the, of, of the possible solution that is looked upon. Um, it, it is not an easy one for no one, I mean, uh, and especially for us Greens, we, we are mostly federalist and, and, and we defend a common uh, path uh, all the time, so it's not an easy decision to take. But um, it, so there was a lot of, of debate in the, in the green groups. Uh, we know that the same debate existed in other groups in the European Parliament. We know that the debate exists also at the level of the Council, but it seems that more and more people are thinking that it could be a solution. And it's not only a solution as a threat um, to, to Viktor Orban and, and uh, Raczynski in Poland, it's, it's something that could really exist. So the idea that the 25 other member states will join together to, to have their own recovery plan and say to Poland and Hungary, well, look, you excluded yourself, so you're not part of it. Once again, as uh, Benedek said earlier, um, we all have the feeling that we have arrived to the very end of, of a process and that if we were to compromise once again this time, Viktor Orban would really cry victory and it would be uh, putting us all in a very bad situation. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is, as I, as I said earlier and as others have said, the misuse of the European funds um, in Hungary and elsewhere makes us also think that, you know, maybe it's time also for Hungarian and citizens and Poland citizens to see the European Union not being used in bad hands. So it is one of the solutions that we may come up to. Uh, but this is, of course, still in discussions for the moment. Everyone has uh, said to Hungary and Poland, we're not moving. Sorry, but it, the compromise we have uh, arrived to will not go lower. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Um, there is another question, more focus on, uh, on Poland. So it's from Maciej from the Polish Greens. Uh, and he asked uh, the peace, so Polish governing uh, party has a very fragile, fragile majority in the parliament and may lose it due to the recent EU crisis. Assuming it happens and the opposition creates a new government, how it should treat peace and other right-wing populism in order first to uphold the rule of law and B, prevent the similar backslide in the future? Maybe that Sylvia can answer to this question. Yes, Sylvia? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I think this is a very important question because uh, uh, observing what is happening right now, we all uh, ask, are asking uh, us the question, what is next? Um, what about the future? What should we do as the first thing after all? Um, and uh, I, I'm not very optimistic about losing the majority uh, by the united right uh, uh, right uh, wing uh, coalition um, but if if the uh, current opposition uh, could create the government and could start um, uh, start uh, the new policies and laws, I, I would suggest investing in NGOs, investing in civil society, in civic education of our citizens, because uh, we need uh, more people active, more people demanding the change, uh, more, more people asking questions, and, uh, and raise the critique uh, towards current policies and laws. 
uh, and uh, investing in education it's is very crucial and unfortunately as i said before uh, previous governments did not do it and uh, we left a lot of uh, groups minorities but also women behind and we cannot uh, expect from them to be active to be uh, uh, to be uh, involved in some movements and protests and demonstrations uh, right now. So uh, I would say education, human rights, as always, and uh, start thinking uh, about uh, human rights instead of uh, instead of highways and uh, uh, common agricultural policy. If we if we do not do it, uh, the Kaczynski would be back very soon. Thank you, Silvia. And I have a last question, maybe for Benedek and also for Matthew. It's a very general question. Uh, is from Jean, how does for you, the failure to tackle the rule of law issue affect the global reputation of the EU, do you think? <laughs> I think it's a very good question. And, and definitely this, um, this fight with the issue of rule of law inside the EU uh, has a great effect on how other countries and globally they, they look at the, the EU. Uh, because um, if the EU is not able to, to stabilize the rule of law within the EU, it may lose its, its um, basic uh, fundamental right uh, to point out um, the breaches of rule of law in any other country. And just we shouldn't look too far away. Uh, there are accession countries, uh, including, for example, Serbia. And just recently, um, there were some information from the Commission that uh, um, the EU is not going to open any uh, um, additional uh, chapters with, uh, with the, or within the negotiations with Serbia regarding the, uh, the membership of the country because of rule of law problems. But um, is this a credible position from the EU uh, against other countries outside the EU if it's not able to, uh, to keep the EU itself within the, uh, the framework of the, uh, of the rule of law. So I think that that's a fundamental uh, question. And on the other hand, and I think um, this is the, the most important lesson to learn from this crisis right here and now, that for, for years or for decades, of course we had beautiful sentences in the treaties and, and the EU law talking about the rule of law and democratic values and, and fundamental principles of the, uh, of the EU. But we tended, or many European decision makers tended to, to look at them as concepts, as beautiful ideas, but real politics is done with money and power. So we should talk about markets and, and uh, economic regulation and things like that. Now what we see that if rule of law is not stable in the EU, very soon this lead us, this takes us, this bring us to a structure crisis of the EU. Without a well-functioning rule of law uh, in the member states and in the EU, the, the very construction of the EU is not functional. And it arrives to a point where it's, we are unable to adopt the next MFF, the budget of the EU, because there are member states which we let to destroy uh, democracy and rule of law in, in those countries. The EU was not able to keep them on the track of the rule of law and, and democracy. And now we are harvesting the consequences of this blindness to the importance of, of rule of law. So I, I hope, and I'm sure that this is really the lesson to learn from this, that, that rule of law is really the very fundament of the European Union, and without a well-functioning 
a system which is able to, uh, to ensure and to guarantee the rule of law in all of the member states, the EU is not able to survive. And Mathieu, from, uh, oui. from an island from the swords, uh, how is uh, not maybe the reputation, but the image of, uh, of EU, if EU is not able uh, to answer to this uh, important question of respect of rule of law? Uh, I think that definitely most people unfortunately have come to see the European Union as, um, as an ATM, as someone else put it. Um, we, we put in some money into the European Union, but um, our government feels very clever and the population feel very clever because we take more money from the European Union than we actually put in. And there's the perception that it's, it's just a cash machine. Um, you get all of the money and there are no obligations. Um, I really liked what, what Sylvia said, that um, stop talking about highways and common agricultural policy and start talking about human rights, because it just goes to the heart of it. And as Benedict said, um, yes, it's, it's power and money that are important. But I, I think that too many people have come to think um, that you can be a part of a free trade zone, um, take all of the money and have absolutely no obligations whatsoever. But free trade zones are, are always about compromises. You, you, can't have, you can't have free trade between member states of the free trade zone unless all of the members are willing to make some compromise. And I think that this is a lesson that the British people are coming to understand now, um, but that's by force. Um, now, the, the kind of power and money of the free, free trade zone gives, gives the European Union that lever that it needs, that it somehow seems reluctant to use. Um, so, the because it it's not using this we're in a kind of position that um other free trade zones with with very weak rule of law are in so for example the united states in the 19th century a federation with no fbi no cross border policing um totally weak rule of law everyone getting away with all kinds of crimes we're sort of in that same situation. Um, and of course, there's not necessarily a need to work towards a federation, but there is definitely a need for member states to understand that you have to compromise. Um, you have to give up some of your sovereignty if you want to be a part of a free trade zone. And that means that um, when your politicians take money from, um, from the European Union, they could become subject to prosecution if they obtain that money corruptly or they use it for corrupt purposes. Um, this is something that I think in the long run, um, all member states are going to be forced to, to understand. There, there simply is no other option because unless the European Union forces member states to understand this. Listen, you have to compromise. Otherwise, that's it. The money taps are going to be turned off. And then the European Union is simply going to fall apart. It's, it's just going to suffer the same fate that other free trade zones with absolutely no oversight or absolutely no compromises um, have suffered. Thank, thank you very much. Uh... Mathieu, and now we are going to the last video because we have a last video, final video message from uh, our friend from Belarus, from Irina Zuki, who is the spokesperson of the Belarusian Green Party. She is also an environmental uh, ex leader expert in public participation and environmental decision making, co-founder of the NGO Echo Home, 
here a video message on the situation in Belarus. It's the last video before we close this plenary. Dear Green colleagues, this year, on 16th of August, I feel myself happy for the first time in many years, actually, for more than two decades. It was the day when more than 200,000 people went to the streets in Minsk, my home city, to protest violent suppression of the demonstrators after the cynical falsification of the presidential election result by Lukashenko regime on the 9th of August. Me and my colleagues in Green Movement of Belarus have been waiting for this kind of popular uprising for more than 20 years. Over these years, Lukashenko, the last dictator of Europe, was permanently strengthening his repressive regime, banning all independent activity, destroying the young civil society of Belarus, which just started to grow after the fall of the Soviet Union. Actually, the dictator tried to simulate Soviet methods, suppression all civic activity, especially on grassroots level and uh, substituted it by bogus imitation. It is actually prohibited to voice one's opinion in the street. The regime called any manifestation unsanctioned mass action. Sanctioned action are only those in favor of the dictator, who was all these long years building up special riot police forces. All presidential election in the last 20 years ended in protest being brutally beaten down by the riot police. More and more brutal each successful time. It has to be said that all political protest in Belarus has been 100% peaceful, each and all times. This year, the brutality of special police forces has beaten all previous uh, records. Detained peaceful protesters were severely beaten and tortured. Human rights activists have documented over 1,800 cases of torture since the 9th of August this year. More than 20,000 peaceful protesters were arrested and spent in prison from 5 to 25 days. Many of them mistreated during detention. Green activists were among the first detained. I myself was arrested for five days. Many of my green colleagues are either in prison or under criminal investigation. Almost all of us activists were arrested not in the street during the rally, but at home. We are this, on the special list of the political police, the KGB, as those who are dangerous for the regime. Our crime is our independence and our civil activity to protect nature and our pro-democracy political position, opposition to dictatorship in our country. The Belarusian Revolution is unique. It is very consistent with the green values. This is non-violence. More than three months, the protest remains non-violent, despite of all the provocation. This is diversity. All groups of the population are included in the protest, and everyone respects each other. This is feminism. Let me remind you that women have become the main driver of protest. This is decentralization and incredible cooperation and solidarity. We believe that Belarus will become a source of experience in new social relations for other countries. And we are not only fighting the regime, we are already working on creating a base for these new models. When the regime falls, we will do everything to make Belarus green. And we are very grateful to the international green community for your support and solidarity. It is very important for us. Thank you for your attention. Живе Беларусь! Thank you. Thank you very much from uh, Belarus. So we see that West, East, North, South, rule of law is today attacked. And I think that our slogan, 
uh, let's act together, is always very actual. You see it from our Greens in government in, uh, in Austria, from our MEP, from the Greens in the, in the cities, from the experts, from the civil society, from the activists. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your fight. Thank you to you that are there in your halls, maybe in your office, to watch to us, to participate to this, uh, to this session. And I want to say also thank you to all our staff and the technician, because it was not easy, but we did it. Let's act together, and thank you very much. <laughs> And thank you very much, uh, Evelyn Huitbroek, for moderating this last debate of the day. Yes, we had an extremely important topic, the EU's rule of law crisis. And thanks to the contribution of the different panelists, I think we have a better understanding of the scale of the problem. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of uh, the informative sessions, not the end of the evening, not yet. Before we move on with the concert, I'd like to uh, mention the initiative through which uh, we can all support artists, creators and performers from Poland. As we heard today in the parallel session on the cultural sector after COVID-19, since the outbreak of COVID-19, cultural workers have been heavily affected. The cultural and creative sector supported our mental and emotional well-being through their work online very often for free. And now we have the opportunity to stand with the cultural workers. The European Greens have launched the Green Family Fund. It's a virtual donation box through which you can show your solidarity and support artists with a donation. All donations collected through the Green Family Fund go to the Polish artists and creators. So you can make uh, your donation by clicking on the contribution button on the left grid of this uh, Spot Me platform, as you can see right here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, we have come to the end, not of the evening as I said before, uh, because now I have the pleasure to announce a great Polish band called Sutari. The band consists of three female singers and they bring invigorating traditional folk music. It's perfect to relax after a very intense but very inspiring day. So thank you very much for joining us today and hopefully uh, you will be able to meet in person next year because we hope it will be in a better situation in 2021. And for now, have a lot of fun at home with a little private party with Sutari. Have a very nice evening. <laughs>